Tis the season for banned and restricted announcements. December 4th brought us a whole new list of changes throughout Magic's constructed formats. Vintage has no changes, but it was mentioned. Let's take a quick dive in and see what Wasi has to say about the vintage format. All right, welcome back, Vintage Gamers. Hot new news straight off the press has dropped. December 4th, banned and restricted announcement for Constructed Magic. Uh, lots of changes here for some of the other formats like Pioneer, Modern, Explorer, and Popper. Uh, I'm not going to go into those because I'm no expert. Uh, I will want to focus on Legacy and Vintage changes. Mostly Vintage, but I do want to touch on Legacy because they said some interesting things inside of that section. One of the great new changes that they've made is they are uh, being a lot more open about what they're doing and what their philosophy for ban and restricting cards is. Uh, they had this little uh, Q&A discussion here with um, Andrew Brown and Dan Musser over on the weekly MTG uh, podcast. Uh, and this was, I thought, a pretty interesting conversation. I'm not going to you know, go through it and do a reaction video or anything to it. I highly recommend you just watch this yourself. Uh, but they do say a lot of interesting things about how they approach bans and restrictions in each format, because for every format, the goals are different. And so I want to focus on what they said here about legacy and vintage and what I think about those philosophies, as well as some concerns I have moving forward. So down here uh, in legacy, there's one line I just really want to touch on. Uh, actually, it's mostly this whole first paragraph. When making changes to legacy, we look at the data through the lens of community sentiment. This is going to be a big, big one in here. Community sentiment. The community is passionate, and we believe the pillars of legacy that players have enjoyed for many years is very important. Players want to play with Brainstorm, Force of Will, and Wasteland, and thus they remain, even though they would have been removed from other formats long ago due to their ubiquity. Now, this is... Uh, a statement I've said about Legacy and Vintage for a very long time. There are cards in these formats. They are called the pillars of the format that are too good. They would be restricted on power levels alone. Uh, however, they are cards that define and make the format unique. And so they are not uh, banned or restricted. And instead, they are banned and restricted around them. Obvious examples, Bazaar of Baghdad and Mishra's Workshop. These are cards that define the format. These are cards that make Vintage Vintage, uh, and they are not restricted because the whole point of playing Vintage is to play with cards like these. So Legacy is a powerful enough format to absorb cards that would otherwise need to be banned in other formats, hence we seldom take action. And I think this basically entire paragraph, and from what they've said in this video, that it also uh, uh, confirms this belief that this entire paragraph uh, plays into both legacy and vintage um, in terms of philosophy behind bans and restrictions. So community sentiment is a main driver. Uh, obviously, play percentage, ubiquity, at power level, these are all drivers as well. Um, but the main thing is community sentiment. And uh, I really do believe that legacy and vintage are excelling recently at absorbing powerful cards into their own game plans. Uh, and it's actually mentioned a lot inside of this vintage section. So let's just do a quick read of the vintage section. Our management of vintage is like that of legacy. We incorporate community sentiment along with data. Cards like the One Ring, Lorien Revealed, Orcish Bowmasters, and Beseech the Mirror have recently found homes in new and existing archetypes. Factually true statement, all of these cards are seeing significant play. Beseech the Mirror has revived Storm-based combo. Bowmasters has been a big player in reviving Control combo. Obviously, Lauren Revealed, if you haven't seen my video on Lauren Revealed, Lauren Revealed, in combination with Urza Saga, is the main driver, in my mind, of this entire format shift um, to more of a balanced state. And the One Ring is a powerful combo card being used inside of Jewel. This format is huge. And despite being around forever, it is remarkable how much exploration of new cards and strategies is possible after all these years. A great sign that this format, which contains most powerful cards, is in a healthy place. Huge agree. I think one of the strengths of Vintage is that you can play with any cards so long as you put those cards in strong shells. Uh, the power of Ancestral Recall and Force of Will and Blue Restricted Cards and Moxon is that... 
they elevate your deck's floor to a place where you can play some probably suboptimal cards that are more enjoyable for you. Uh, and you see that in lots of the brews that I make. I'll take a Tinker deck and I'll put in some cards that are interesting or new, try out them, see how their power level works. Um, obviously, Vintage is not a place where you can just drop in and make a whole new you know, deck philosophy, deck identity, core structure. That takes a lot to meet the power level required of the format. But the power level of individual cards doesn't need to be as high because of the power level of the historical cards. Um, and I think that is definitely the case right now. There's tons and tons of decks that are housing a variety of cards in a different types of uh, uh, macro archetypes. And if someone tells you Vintage isn't in a healthy place right now, I question what they consider a healthy place. Because to me, Vintage is in the most healthy place it's been in absolutely in years. Vintage right now is balanced in terms of win rate. It's balanced in terms of meta share. No meta share is overly um, above like the norm. There have been times where, you know, decks are over 20% of the metagame and that hasn't, hasn't really been the case in the last few months of vintage. Um, you are seeing decks from all types, combo, control, uh, Bazaar of Baghdad decks, workshop decks have their place. Everything seems to fit into a place and into a healthier place too. As much as I say Bazaar of Baghdad is a pillar of the format, it is also a huge barrier to players enjoying the format. Bazaar of Baghdad creates a very specific type of game that you have to be willing to play to play vintage, and some players are just not willing to do that. Bazaar of Baghdad is a deck that I think is very good for vintage in terms of identity, and um, you know its existence I think is a good thing. However, it's always better if Bazaar of Baghdad is not the best deck or the largest meta share. And right now, with Bizarre Bad Dad being less than 10% of the meta share, I think it's actually in the healthiest place it's been since I started playing Vintage. Um, that kind of carries into this idea of many people will want a metagame to be healthy, and healthy is very much a loose term. Uh, my personal view is you typically want your best deck and your highest meta share to not be a deck that produces on, you know, unhealthy gameplay or you mostly want it to be a fair deck uh and now the the definition of fair in vintage is very very much uh debatable and it is definitely going to be different from fair in other formats but having a control deck as your best deck or your most popular deck is typically a better sign of a healthy metagame than having a combo deck be your best deck it was like a little concerning the year where dredge was the best deck or the year where grixis saga was the best deck um, but having these blue controlling Luris decks as the best deck is usually a good sign. So, second paragraph. While not particularly new card, Urza's Saga has propagated its way into a myriad of macro archetypes. The introduction of Lorien Revealed has allowed folks to glue their Urza Saga mana together uh, with the ability to find blue sources using colorless mana, acting as a mana source to pitch the Force Will, or at worst case, a five mana recall. This paragraph is basically... My entire Lorien revealed video in one in one sentence, or you know, in a couple sentences here. Uh, if you haven't watched the Lorien revealed video, I, I highly recommend you watch it, especially if you haven't been playing Vintage recently. Vintage has been changed completely by the fact that this card exists, an island cycler that pitches the forceful. Um, and people have recently been arguing that's not a good thing, uh, and I'll, I'm going to probably disagree with that, and I'll tell you why in a second. We'll keep our eyes on how these cards continue to impact the formats, especially after the internal, current Eternal Weekends come to a close. Vintage is an issue in Power Form format, but we're happy with no changes for now. So, this is where it comes back to community sentiment. And something that concerns me a lot is the community sentiment against Urza's Saga and Lorien Revealed. Um, and I'm concerned because... If enough players just don't want Saga to be a four of, it, it can get restricted, right? Like, this is a thing we've seen in Legacy in the past with Ragavan, where the data does not um, show that Ragavan needs to be banned on power level or sh meta share reasons, but it's community sentiment that is the main driver. And right now, Urza Saga is a very um, uh, contested topic. People are vehemently opposed or sometimes for. Urza Saga, uh, in a way I haven't seen in a while. And um, this actually was brought up recently. There was a poll from, from the Japanese side of Vintage, 
And it's something like 75% of the players in that poll, you know, it's a small poll and it's, you know, not the best you know, representation, but it seems to me, and this matches like some of the vibes that I was getting on Twitter, that the Japanese player base, which is, you know, a very dedicated vintage player base, especially in paper, unproxy, uh, no proxy paper, um, does not like the existence of Urza Saga in the metagame as an unrestricted four up. Um, and that has a kind of a strong following as well in the English speaking side. And I really worry that something will occur based on community sentiment that doesn't really push the format in a good direction. In my mind, Urza Saga and in combination with Lorien Revealed have been the main driver in pushing us into this very, very healthy game state. Um, because opponents have to interact with Urza Saga and their Urza Saga is bringing these games to these longer games, games that are more based on permanence and interaction, uh, games that are more based on creatures. Um, these are very much not types of games that you would typically associate with Vintage. Vintage is a lot about the stack sometimes. It's a lot about uh, the graveyard and, and, and artifacts. Um, and, I, and I truly believe that the card Urza Saga and Lorien Revealed have pushed us really into, the, into this current state. And so the idea that we would restrict Urza Saga because community doesn't like it uh, doesn't like how it changes, you know, maybe makes some amount of deck building uh, less interesting, maybe makes um, ties like archetypes together and makes them a little samey. Uh, this idea that we would blow up what we've <laughs> what we have right now just to 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 shake things up and and uh, and, and appease this kind of community sentiment does worry me. Um, and I'm not saying that it will be, you know, it's hard to predict fallout of a restriction, especially of a restriction of a card like Urza Saga or Lorien Revealed, where the cards are not so strong that they're broken, but they are manipulating and warping the format around them. Like, it's you know, you can't argue that Urza Saga and Lorien Revealed haven't completely changed the context of the format. That's definitely the case. The thing is, I would say that they've changed the context of the format for a better and in a very meaningful and visible way. So that's just like the, something I've been thinking about recently. Uh, I don't think it's something we need to worry about right now. Uh, but if this kind of continued uh, sentiment and is used in a way that will change the format, I'll be very interested to see what happens uh, if that it does occur. Sorry if that does a little rambly, a little bit incoherent maybe. Um, but I, I just something that I wanted to vent about recently. And obviously people push different ideas of what my opinions of Urza Saga are, but I think I've always been pretty clear. I have an hour-long video about the card Urza Saga um, from maybe a year or two ago now, uh, where you can learn, like, basically everything you need to know about this card, pre-Lorian revealed, obviously. Um, this is one of the best lands ever printed. This is a format-defining staple. This is extremely powerful. I will never tell you that, like, you know, Saga is truly unplayable or is bad in the in the sense like most of these time what i'm saying these things is more of you know acting for the joke or this kind of thing the urza saga is the real deal however despite despite what people might say urza saga does have deck building consequences playing this card means it's hard to cast your lavinia playing this card means you're exposed to targeted enchantment removal uh, playing this card means you don't have the island to play your Ancestral Recall to do your this, do your that. Um, I just want to make sure that people understand that this isn't like some card that comes with no cost. There's a very real and very apparent cost, and when you play with the card, you definitely understand that. Uh, there's a, even a cost to the activating ability of making constructs. Two, two and another colorless land tap to make a construct is a cost. Even if people tell you that's basically free, it's not. It costs mana and time, and in a format where you don't always have a lot of time. Uh, anyways, we're going we're gonna to pa pass that. So, how do I feel about this exact banner restricted announcement? This is good. This is great. This is a good announcement because I think no changes is easily the way to go, especially with ongoing Eternal Weekends. You don't want to mess up Eternal Weekend NA um, just because that's something that you want to change something. Uh, in terms of evaluation of the format, I think they're spot on. I think we're in a good spot. Changes could occur later, but as of for right now, we're really good. I think the thing that I 
am pushing for, and a lot of other players, at least in the English speaking community, are pushing for is unrestrictions. Um, something Wizard said in their video and in some follow up tweets is that unrestrictions are not a really a priority for them. They're not something they're like pushing really hard to do. Um, but what I would say is if we are going to be looking at community sentiment, at least from what I hear among the English speaking community, and I always want to say that because I think it'd be a real disservice to our global format if I were to speak for players who I can't understand what they're saying, right? I think the communities over, especially in Japan uh, and in Europe, these are large communities. These are vibrant communities. They're putting out weekly paper non-proxy events inside of Japan. Um, and their opinion is important and needs to be heard, right? So when I say some of these things, I always want to make sure I preface by saying these is what I'm hearing inside of the English speaking community that I am typically a part of. Uh, and from what I can tell within that community is there's an overwhelming majority of players who are interested in the ideas of unrestrictions. There are a lot of cards on the vintage restriction list that are there because of things that happened in the past that are no longer super relevant to the current format. Um, and I think that unrestrictions are really good drivers of engagement and uh, in the format. Like when we saw Fastbound Unrestricted, I know many players from outside of Vintage who came in to say, oh, wow, I saw this Fastbound was unrestricted in Vintage. I want, I want to give it a try because on Magic Online, it's very easy to jump into Vintage. It is a format that is not even more expensive than Modern. It's typically less expensive than Modern. So these kind of unrestrictions and like little, um, you know, this, this page is going to be viewed by so many players, so many Magic players. And when you see Vintage changes, and unrestrictions, it, it drives interest. And one of the biggest things about Vintage right now is we just need more players, right? And so I like the idea. There's a bunch of things that are I consider and some of the and some of the uh, other people in the format consider to be um, safe unrestrictions. And those are really easy ways to drive engagement. And then you get to a, a point where you're out of safe ones and you have a little bit more unsafe. But the thing is, I think those are okay too. And the reason is in other formats like modern, there's a very real cost to unrestriction, like to unban something and then reban something. And the cost of that is cards uh, and, and people acquiring cards. Uh, cards have a secondary market. Cards do cost money. And when you invalidate someone's deck that they just bought, it is not a good thing. However, Vintage doesn't have this concern to the same degree. And that's actually a really odd thing to say when Vintage is the most expensive format, theoretically. But the, the main point I'll make here is that Vintage is predominantly played right now on Magic Online and in proxies and paper outside of Japan. I should, always, I should definitely preface that. In the English-speaking and world and communities in Europe, Almost all paper vintages play to some amount in, with some amount of proxy cards to play test cards. Um, and on Magic Online, the format's uh, cost is not dissimilar to other formats. And it's a lot less than in paper. So if we're going to be playing mostly on Magic Online and with proxies in paper, the actual cost of trying to unrestrict something and then having to re-restrict something is actually much lower. So I would say the vintage community and even the legacy community to an extent are much more open to the idea of let's try to unrestrict X. And if it doesn't work, if it becomes too good, we can re-restrict it. That's okay. And so the big hurdle there is WotC buy-in and because it's not something they want to really do. Uh, it's a risk for them. Uh, so it's, it's about showing that the community sentiment is for these kind of unrestriction ideas. I think that's all I really want to say on the topic. I hope this video isn't too long or too too drowning on. Uh, I'd love to hear what you have think in the comments. I specifically would like to hear what you think about the current metagame, how you view its health. Do you think the current metagame is healthy? Because 
I do know people who don't think the metagame is healthy, and I, I'm trying to understand w under what parameters that's true and why they believe that. And so I'd like to hear why you think the metagame is currently healthy or unhealthy. I want to think what I want to hear what you have to think say about Urza Saga and Lorien revealed. Um, and I want to hear what you have to say about unrestrictions, the concept of unrestrictions. Um, thanks for watching. I'm going to put out more vintage gameplay content every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on this channel. I'll see you then.